Do you, do you want me to tell you how it all started? Is it? I'm serious. So I got a call one day asking me to do this story on medical marijuana and I thought, okay. I've been a reporter for 20 plus years. I've seen a lot of human tragedy. I've seen, unfortunately, natural disasters. I've seen a lot of death and destruction. And I've got to admit that my perceptions around marijuana were not great. But I went into this story and I never expected it to change my life as profoundly as it did. I went to Tamworth and I met a 24-year-old boy called Dan Haslam. And he was not your typical 24-year-old. Can you take us back to the day of, of diagnosis? You were only 20. 20. Yeah. So. Um, I was in Sydney for a festival and a friend called me. The doctor said he might have bowel cancer because he noticed a bit of um, blood and I'd noticed a bit of blood. So I thought, oh, sugar, this is, what am I doing? So I've organised a colonoscopy. Anyway, I had it and then, yeah, the doctor just said we've found a, a large bowel tumour. We saw the surgeon here and he said, look, I don't really think there's anything I can do for Dan. And um, it took a long time to sink in. Chemo is absolutely awful. <laughs> it's, um, well, it's poison. It, you get poison, it just goes straight into your heart. He would leave the clinic on the Wednesday. He would be as sick as a dog. He wouldn't eat for five days. He would lose weight. His condition would just fall away. This is no good for a cancer patient. Dan wasn't coping with it very well. He wasn't coping with chemotherapy. Um, they were calling the chemotherapy a re-challenge, but they were running out of options. The family were then offered the option of using marijuana to combat the nausea. I was just like everybody else, or just like the general population, and, and I thought it was, you know, a, a demon drug, and it had been vilified for so long. Mm. Yeah. But I was desperate by that stage. I thought, wow, great, yeah, let's do it. And what grabbed the public's attention was the support of Dan's dad, a retired policeman who'd headed up anti-drug squads during a 35-year career in the force. As soon as he was introduced to cannabis, he had a smoke before he went to the clinic. He wasn't sick. He had his chemo, he came, we went out that evening. We had steak and eggs. That evening, I can't believe it. And, he, and, a, and a, a smoke, that's all we're talking about here. It was as close to a miracle as I've ever seen. He wouldn't eat normally for at least three days during chemotherapy. It was just the opposite. And we just all sat and looked at each other in stunned disbelief. I still get the side effects. Yeah. I still get the ulcers and the upset belly, and but I'm not sick. I don't burn my throat. I don't lose weight. I don't spend days in hospital. So it's changed my life. I think the first time I ever tried to smoke, when I finally thought I'd give it a go, I ended up lighting my moustache on fire. Um, <laughs> I just cough, I splutter, I make... Everything about it just looks so uncool. Um, yeah, it's a big learning curve. <laughs> when we came out publicly in the local paper, it was like a domino effect, really. All of a sudden, you'd open the paper and here would be a story about the local mayor supporting you, the deputy mayor, all of the councillors, then the local police superintendent, which was huge. Yeah, the first thing I thought was, wow, you know, like, surely this can't be that simple. I thought, you know, that there's something that, um, you know, both Lou and I prosecuted people for for many, many years. I had no idea that uh, cannabis could be used for medicinal purposes in the way that I've now learned that it can be. And hearing about Dan, about Dan's story, and that's what changed it for me. So it changed your yeah. entire perception? Yeah, almost overnight. 
We're not, we're not making this up. We're not pulling it out of the, out of the sky. You're basically doing what any dad would do, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was like this little ripple effect was getting wider and wider and wider, and right at the middle of it was Tamworth, which was a really conservative, um, you know, very straight kind of conservative country town. And what it did was quite extraordinary. It opened up a huge amount of compassion for the issue, but it also opened, I think, the way for a lot of Australians to finally have some courage to tell their story. And one by one, we started to see that. We started to see this huge picture emerging. It wasn't just for pain relief. And Dan ended up becoming this unbelievable catalyst for the rest of the nation. We're not trying to end the ban on recreational drug use. We're just trying to get it treated as medicinally. We, we were considered criminals in our own country for just trying to care and love someone. I'm calling for all, all the other cancer patients and carers that have been emailing me. Be strong and help. I don't like this. I don't like the media attention. Now we just need some other people to get in there and help me along because I'm struggling a bit. And I don't want to feel like a crook for it. And I don't want all the old cockies up at oncology that are just, they don't want to break the law, but they're suffering. I want them to be able to go and treat themselves and help themselves and help their families, not watch them just die and suffer. It was Dan's story to start with, but I think that was the turning point. It, it now was Australia's story, really and the story literally took on a life of its own. the difference between cannabis and marijuana? Well, marijuana is really a contrived name. Cannabis is really the botanical name. And marijuana was the name used by the, the Mexicans and uh, was the name that the Americans stuck to it. And, and indeed, they even spelled it two ways. They spelled it with the American uh, H and with, with, the, with the Spanish J. So they were a bit ambivalent about it, but it really is a contrived American name that derives from that period. The use of cannabis for medical purposes is not a recent phenomenon. Its medical origins date back 5,000 years. It was first introduced to Western medicine in 1841, when cannabis resin was successfully used by a physician to treat a child's convulsions. And for most of the 1930s, American pharmaceutical companies sold extracts of cannabis as medicine until it fell under a blanket of drug prohibition law. In the 1920s, American physicians wrote 3 million prescriptions a year that contained cannabis. In 1937, there were 28 over-the-counter preparations that contained cannabis. I mean, cannabis use, was widely used medically up until about 68 years ago. Um, it fell out of favour, it became illegal and fell out of the armamentarium of, of treatments that doctors have available to them. How would you describe the difference between recreational cannabis and medicinal cannabis? Well, it's, it's actually simpler than people think. Uh, recreational cannabis is designed to help people get high. Um, a whole bunch of different compounds in the plant cannabis. The compound that uh, recreational consumers chase is tetrahydrocannabinol or del delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol or THC. The plants which are bred for recreational consumption are either hydroponically grown or indeed genetically bred uh, for THC levels above 20%. Um, and this ain't the weed that your mama smoked. Uh, this is a very different product. The product that we want has a much higher concentration of CBD and a much lower concentration of THC. The product is known as cannabidiol. For the parents of children diagnosed with a chronic form of epilepsy known as intractable, 
it's given cannabis a whole new status as a possible treatment alternative. Tasia first started getting um, seizure activity when she was about three. And from there, it just began to spiral out of control to the point we were finding her in unconscious, not breathing in bed. The nighttime seizures were probably the most important ones because they were the most dangerous. She wouldn't have a huge tonic clonic seizure through the day. What's would, that exactly? Tonic clonic's when they're full jerking, um, the whole body's moving. Daishas were unique that they, she wouldn't actually get one of those until she'd fall asleep. We'd done a trip to Melbourne. We had seen professors in neurology in Sydney. Um, we have alarms on her bed. We have monitors in the house. We had done everything possible, you know, under conventional medications. <sighs> to see your daughter just um, slowly regressing all the time was the most heartbreaking thing, you know? To see things that she used to be able to do and she wasn't doing it. And she was either getting brain damage from the epilepsy or she was like a zombie from um, all the anticonvulsants. I mean, if you and I took the equivalent of what she was taking, we'd be knocked out for a week. We needed an answer and we weren't getting an answer from anything else we tried. So when did you find out about medicinal cannabis? Ah, uh, good old Dr Google and looked at America where they've got a thing called Charlotte's Web. Charlotte's Web is a strain of cannabis named after Charlotte Figgy from Colorado. It's rich in CBD, the non-psychoactive compound. Cannabis oil reduced Charlotte's seizures dramatically, and her story led to medical marijuana legalisation across several US states. We had a decision to make. Either we sit back and do nothing and watch Daisha continue to regress or die, or we find an answer for ourselves. So we just started on a, on a low dose of recommendation of just of one mil three times a day. And we built that up over a couple of days. But within three days, we started seeing Daisha become, come alive. You know, there was just this personality you start seeing coming out and, and doing things that we hadn't seen for years, basically. <laughs> To be honest, when it started, I was horrified, probably as a conservative medical practitioner. I thought this is really not good for my patients because that's my primary interest is I want to make my patients better and help them to get better. Did you want to do this yourself or you want me to do it? Yeah. Okay, all right. Ready, set, one, two, three, open. Or are you going to do it quick? Um, what's this? It's your medicine. You know exactly what it's it is. Our... You're being difficult now. Quick, open. Good girl. Is it all gone? Show me. Gone. Good girl. High five. If we had have had medicinal cannabis three to four years ago, the amount of brain damage we would have saved Dacia from would have been astronomical, you know. Um, so if other people can save their children from that, they need to know about it. Are you encouraged by her results? I'm encouraged by the fact that it certainly helps some of the patients and that's what we have to explore, which patients it makes a big difference to. But the reality is in the children with these very severe epilepsies, often nothing works. These doctors who have given Daisha this diagnosis of, you know, you're either going to continue to regress or, or die from this, and all of a sudden there's this miraculous turnaround, wouldn't they or shouldn't they want to know why and, and investigate that further? Someone needs to take a stance and see these kids and see the difference that it makes to, to them and to the families. Look, if you want to come and study Daisha, come and study Daisha. I think the euphoria around the panacea is what makes it so difficult to deal with. And 
the fact that none of the data is filtered so that we don't really see in the media the 10 children where it didn't work as well as the one child where it did. The media only is showing us about the good news cases. To this day, we have had no seizure activity at all. And that's just opened up so much for us, for Dacia. Um, you know, she, she, she couldn't read or write before. She can now read, she can write. It's opened up her world, it's opened up our world and her brothers and sisters as well. What's been the biggest difference? <laughs> Getting my Father's Day card. She actually wrote me a Father's Day card with Happy Father's Day on it, love you, Daisha. And it was just those little things that mean so much that people take for granted. We didn't have that, and there we do. In your time as a specialist, have you ever seen anything outside the existing paradigm and medication that's given receive this amount of attention? No, I have not seen any area that I've ever worked in have so much media attention. And uh, I've been telling my patients it's trial by media. And in fact, it's changed the whole equation. But I don't feel we have real research studies out, double blind, placebo, randomised controlled trials. We need those, and then we will have a clear cut answer. As a physician, if medicinal cannabis becomes available in a way that's different to the current model, we'll have to be the implementers, the prescribers for cannabis in this situation. And that's terribly important. We prescribe safely and effectively and that's where the data are so thin or even lacking. The problem probably is that there is not a lot of information that's widely available on this. One does have to go digging for it, and that's not accidental. One has to emphasise that any research into cannabis has been effectively blocked for the last 100 years. But researching cannabis in the US remains difficult. It's still classified as a Schedule I substance, in this category, it's both illegal under federal US law and considered to have no value as a therapeutic agent. Clinical investigations are also hampered by the access to actually obtain research-grade cannabis from the National Institute of Drug Abuse, which is subject to rigorous approval processes. The National Institute of Drug Abuse has, number one, lied, and number two, distorted uh, the science, and number three, they don't fund science that shows the medicinal benefit of cannabis. The good folk at NIDA in the United States have spent a long time uh, producing studies that merely demonstrate the harmful aspects of cannabis. E even in the context of blocking good research, there's still enough evidence uh, for the use of medical cannabis to advocate for it. And what people are angry about is this is basically a harmless substance. If your kid is having hundreds of seizures a day, like with Dravet syndrome, and you give them a non-psychoactive CBD containing extract, and they go from hundreds of seizures a day, developmentally disabling, to one or two a week, one or two a month, and our government and I mean our governments are preventing parents from doing that? One of the reasons we're in a mess with medicinal cannabis around the world is that it's been so difficult to get the research done. It's been difficult to get funds, it's been difficult to get ethics approval, and then if you got funds and ethics approval to conduct the research, it's been almost impossible to get cannabis to actually uh, do the research with, not just in Australia, but in the United States where most of the re medical research in the world is carried out. And so this has affected the whole world. One place where research has been quietly carried out for decades is Israel, and more specifically, Jerusalem.
Jerusalem, you'll find some of the most compelling signs about the properties of the cannabis plant. And it's largely due to the pioneering work of the man who's come to be known as the godfather of medicinal cannabis, Professor Raphael Meshulam. Okay. Because of his findings, this ancient medicinal plant has a new life. Professor Meshulam began studying cannabis at a time when nobody else in the world was, in the early 1960s. His start was an unconventional one. We got some cannabis from the police, five kilos of cannabis. They were very nice. They broke the laws and we broke the laws. It turned out that they were not allowed to give us the, the hashish and I was not allowed to take it. So if this had happened in the States, I would have ended in prison. But Israel is a small country, so I went to the Ministry of Health, who are in charge of these things, and said, I apologize, I won't do it again, I'll go through you. Within months, his work was noticed by the world. Famously, he discovered the only psychoactive compound in the plant, THC. He was also the first scientist to discover what would come to be recognised as another significant compound, CBD. For almost half a century, his work was funded by US grants. They never interfered with what I was doing. I had to apply, of course, and tell them what I'm doing and why it is important. But they never interfered. They were very, very liberal with the research uh, my lab was doing. That's how I was able to do research with cannabis for almost 50 years. Now, morphine was isolated from opium about 200 years ago, and cocaine was isolated from coca leaves 150 years previously. And yet, the structure of the active compound or active compounds in cannabis was not known. There were a few others that turned out to be very interesting. Another one was cannabidiol, which is a major one and the compound does not cause any side effects. The compound does not have uh, psychoactivity. Completely innocuous compound, if you wish. The next step was learning how cannabis reacts to the body's own system. And the professor and his team found it was through two cannabinoid receptors. In other words, our body responds directly to the plant. Researchers dubbed these receptors CB1 and CB2. CB1 receptors are expressed mainly in the brain. CB2 receptors mainly in the immune system. And people will know about CB2 a lot in the next 20, 30 years. It's sitting there doing not much, but if needed, it all of a sudden starts, uh, it's produced in much larger amounts and it is a protective mechanism of our body. Collective work on the plant has now led to the most significant discovery of all, a major physiological mechanism in our body known as the endocannabinoid system. It turns out that this may be extremely important, very important in human disease states. Do you think the majority of people understand this? Well, uh, I hope that the physicians will understand it. So why aren't there clinical trials to support this research? Well, it's very complicated. The regulations are such that one needs a lot of backing, and there is a lot of background knowledge in the cannabinoid field, but one needs also a lot of clinical trials. Clinical trials cost a lot of money. And as the pharma companies are not doing that, there is nobody to do it. In Israel, we had a, a change. Many years ago, the Ministry of Health, about 10 years ago, decided we should go slowly ahead. It's resulted in Israel conducting the largest human trials in the world, where medicinal cannabis is administered to patients legally. Dr. Mihail Dor heads the program. I gathered together all the prominent physicians in Israel, asked them to do the homework, to examine the evidence, and then decide together what is the indication that will allow it to be used. 
Doctors are not limited by the diagnosis, which means they can treat a wide range of diseases, from chronic pain syndromes to digestive ailments. Basically, we allow it to treat pain, which is symptom, not a diagnosis or disease. So you're treating so, symptoms only? Uh, I, yes, basically those are symptoms. Those symptoms can be in any disease. Since the medicinal cannabis program was introduced in 2007, more than 20,000 patients have been treated. The program even subsidises soldiers suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Now we know the direction it's going into. How many more will it be? I really don't know. 40, 60,000? Depends upon the research. But the tendency is upwards, absolutely. Israel, a number of licensed farms have been established to grow specialised strains of cannabis targeting specific ailments from Tourette's syndrome to epilepsy and even neurological conditions such as multiple sclerosis. The first and the largest of these farms has been set up here in Israel's north. It's called Tikkun Olam. In Hebrew, it means healing the world. אנחנו נמצאים בעצם בחממת אימהות, שמבחינתנו זה בעצם הבונקר הגנטי. כל הגנטיקות שלנו בעצם נמצאות פה, וכל הריבוי שאנחנו עושים הוא מתחיל מפה. תיקון עולם is one of eight government approved farms which produce specialized designer strains of the female cannabis plant. It's these plants which contain the medicinal properties of cannabis. What we need is to check every plant or every plantation, how much of every ingredient is inside. Australia's setup is a remarkable contrast. It's fertile ground for hemp, one of the world's most durable fibres. It's legally grown under licence for industrial purposes and doesn't contain THC. But medicinal cannabis in Australia is illegal, and the only way of obtaining it is through a black market. One of Australia's most outspoken cannabis oil producers to the black market is Dr. Andrew Catalaris. He was deregistered in 2005 for refusing to stop recommending and supplying cannabis to patients. I've been working with medical cannabis for now 25 years. I really became involved because of the failure of the hospital-based medicine. I was working in a hospital, a tertiary referral hospital, and became very aware of the shortcomings of the allopathic drugs, the opiates, and the other drugs used in chronic pain. How many children would you estimate that you're currently treating? I'm treating about 24 children currently, and that's only for lack of material. I could certainly multiply that by orders of magnitude if we had more material. One of Andrew's biggest success stories has been Daisha. In some of them, it's nothing short of dramatic. Even if only 30%, and it's probably at least twice that, respond in the way we've seen our best responders, that's reason enough, right? It's unequivocal. It has become a life-changing medication. And you speak from first-hand experience. Absolutely. Were you ever scared about giving her the oil? At first, the thought of it, I was like anybody. Is my daughter going to get high? Cherie Dell turned to medicinal cannabis when she felt she had run out of treatment options for her daughter, Abby, diagnosed with a rare neurological condition. When she was eight months old, we got a diagnosis of CDKL5. Basically, the kids that have the condition can usually never walk, talk or feed themselves. And they have uncontrolled seizures, low muscle tone, 
possible scoliosis, most of them are legally blind due to cortical visual impairment. And they didn't know what was going to happen with her, how long she had to live, you know, yeah. And then on top, the seizures that could take her at any moment as well. That was a seizure then? A small one, yeah. That's nothing compared to what they have been. How does it feel relying essentially on a black market? Horrible. At any minute I could run out of her cannabis and potentially lose her. It shouldn't be that way. These kids need this. It's not, it's not something that we want. It's something that she needs to live. If she doesn't have it, she'll more than likely die. But even for parents who've had success with the oil, their single biggest worry remains being forced to access a product they have no way of identifying. I have lots of concerns, especially this year where it has become more mainstream and it's more in the media, that there are a lot more backyarders on jumping on the bandwagon and selling people who are desperate, you know, some type of oil, whether they're getting the right oil or anything else, they don't know. And I've heard of cases like that, where, you know, been, been sold canola oil. This troubles me greatly, the unregulated market that we live in, uh, and that patients are being sent cannabis oil, but nobody knows which compounds are in it, how much THC there is in it, how recently it's been tested. It should be on the regular market so it can be properly regulated so that it's not on the black market because it's when you have things on the black market that you get the quality control issues. It's the quality control issues which have led some parents of children with epilepsy to take matters into their own hands and set up grow rooms in their own homes. One frustrated parent recently posted this video filmed in his kitchen instructing parents how to make their own cannabis oil. Even so, growers say there are still many people who rely on them for help. Now this is a cannabidiol tincture and a cancer patient would use this for controlling metastasizing cancers or also for um, bone cancer, which is very, very effective. This is a sativa. Mark Heinrich is another cannabis oil producer in demand. The majority of people he's contacted by are cancer sufferers. How many people would you say you've assisted so far? Hundreds. Not just cancer patients, but people with serious illness. But over the last five years, probably, um, it would be well over a thousand. And that's in the last five years. And that number's rising. It is every day. I'm very emotional when I talk about these cancer patients. Helen, they're, they're just beautiful people. Beautiful people. What, what makes you emotional about it? <sighs> that I'm able to do something profound for them that doesn't involve money. How many people would you estimate contact you? It'd be at least 100 a week. And a lot of people have given up too, because once they've contacted once we don't have a supply. But yeah, hundreds. Now that the knowledge of the therapeutic efficacy of cannabis, and not only in epilepsy, but in a range of other conditions, is becoming obvious, there is a deluge of people seeking help, and this is the only practical way they can actually achieve that help. This is Taylor, he's eight years old. He has uncontrolled epilepsy. My son, Lindsay, age 16, has a brain tumour, epilepsy and Asperger's. We he... were told that there was something more that could be done medically to treat her seizures. He has had a massive reduction in his seizures when he's been in the US on this treatment. Medicinal cannabis holds significant potential for so many. Step up Australia, these kids deserve better. That's great. But there are some families who've had to face the consequences of using an illegal substance to treat their child. Cassie and Rhett Batten were inspired to speak out about using the cannabis oil to treat their epileptic son after Dan Haslam shared his story to a national TV audience. 
I don't want to cry in there, but I can't stop crying. Oh. But shortly after, they were raided by police and their entire supply of cannabis oil seized. Oil, they say, was dramatically reducing their son Cooper's seizures. It took six months before they were cleared, thanks to a change of government and a new Victorian Premier who issued an exemption on behalf of the government. Around the country, the raids continue. What the political masters have to understand is that a month is a long time for someone with intractable epilepsy, a year is an eternity, and five years is a death sentence. Remember, they die at a rate of 15% a year. One in seven children with intractable epilepsy die as a result of that disease. This isn't a disease where the clock stands still, it marches on, and we have to keep up with that. There might be some people out there that perhaps have a more cautionary approach to, to treating children, because it is a, a grey area in terms of, of the medicine around it. What would you say to them? It's only a grey area here. I mean, if you look overseas to Israel and other places in, in Europe and America, they've been doing it for, and especially Israel, they've been doing it for a long, long time. So it's only a grey area here, and it's only a grey area because they make it a grey area. We use it as a medication. We don't use it as a drug. I look at it as another medicine. Professor Tally lerman Segui is the head of paediatric neurology at Wolfson Medical Center at Holon, just south of Tel Aviv. It's one of four hospitals in Israel involved in medicinal cannabis trials treating childhood epilepsy. There's no parent that I haven't been able to convince that it would, this would be the right step for their child. And I have very orthodox patients. So even in the orthodox world where you can't even talk about, you know, marijuana, they're ready to give it to their children. What we explain to the patients, and the parents of course, is that uh, the only side effect that we see is drowsiness. And it's also only in the beginning and after they get used to it, it goes away. And that it's not psychoactive, it doesn't cause hallucinations, it doesn't cause them to be high. And it has a medical logic. Uh, מרוב תרופות, הגוף יצא מהשליטה, והיה יומיים שרק של התקפים, הגענו לטיפול נמרץ. חמישה ימים היינו בטיפול נמרץ. When he started using the cannabis, did you have any results from it? הוא התחיל לפני חודשיים בערך. התחלנו במינון של טיפה, ולאט לאט אנחנו מעלים טיפות. הגענו כבר ל-20 טיפות בלילה ו-13 טיפות ביום. הוא מאוד קשוב, הוא מאוד ערני, הדיבור מאוד השתפר, יש לו קשר יותר טוב עם הסביבה ועם אנשים סביבו, הוא יותר שקט, הוא פחות אנרגטי, אבל בלילה כשהוא ישן עדיין יש לו כמו התכווצויות כאלה, אבל גם הרבה יותר טוב, יש שיפור מאוד יפה עם יאלי. יאלי! It's a new boy. It's new יאלי. You must be very happy. Yes, I'm very happy. But we need now in the night. So still at night, there's yes, seizures. Yes, but in the day, it's very good. Every different kind of seizures, I've used it. And what I found is that you can't predict. You can't say it only works on one kind. It can work on any kind of epilepsy or not. So we're learning as we go. It's not a wonder drug. It's not what is called the magic bullet. 
It doesn't treat all epilepsy. I don't want parents to think that uh, this is a cure of their child's epilepsy. It's not. It works, but it works like another medication. So I would consider it another medication for epilepsy. It should be offered early because it has uh, so little side effects. Do you wish that you'd known about the cannabis earlier? כן, הייתי מאוד שמחה ולהפסיק לו את כל התרופות שהוא מקבל, כי יש להם המון תופעות לוואי. אנחנו גם עכשיו מנסים ללחוץ שהורידו לאט לאט התרופות הרגילות, ושנשאר רק עם הקנאביס. We're using medications sometimes that have really severe side effects, that uh, there are drugs that can uh, harm your liver and have caused a plastic anemia, and patients have died of it. And we're using them. We continue using these medications on these intractable patients. There's medications that we give that have caused patients to lose their eyesight, and we're still using them. So why hesitate using a medication that has relatively no side effects? There's a public debate, an important debate, about medicinal cannabis. Certainly, I'm advised by the experts, many patients who try this, this is medicinal cannabis now for pain, often find the, the side effects a real problem. You know, their mental changes, uh, etc. They find that a problem, and that can be a real issue for people. I believe certainly there's an attitude that, that says that uh, this can't be good because we're dealing with a substance of abuse, and that's a real problem in itself. Uh, in the case of schizophrenia, um, Despite what some people say, the jury's not out on this. There are reputable researchers who uh, say that there is a clear risk of schizophrenia, but there are also others who say that there isn't a risk or that the risk is very small. The reality is that cannabis is a very safe preparation if used in, in modest dosage. According to a UN report, Australians, along with the United States and New Zealand, are the world's greatest users of cannabis per head of population. But one thing is for sure, as cannabis consumption has been increasing, schizophrenia hasn't been increasing. The link between schizophrenia and cannabis use is the most contentious part of the medicinal cannabis debate. Large volumes of research have been dedicated to the issue over the years, and one common conclusion is that frequent use of cannabis between the ages of 15 and 25 can lead to psychosis or an unmasking effect, aggravating existing schizophrenia, particularly on the developing brain of young males. But the evidence is largely based on heavy cannabis abuse over a long period, which typically involves high levels of THC. Medicinal cannabis is generally only administered twice a day and contained to a modest dosage, compared to the amount used by a recreational user. And they can titrate the right dose for them. That is, they can uh, work out when they've had enough cannabis to relieve their symptoms, but not too much to get unwanted side effects. What is interesting about a lot of the evidence regarding the harms of uh, recreational cannabis is that some of the more uh, rigorous and intimidating studies, which are true and real, uh, come from the last 10 years. The last 10 years has seen uh, a very well-documented and well-accepted rise in the quantities of THC in the cannabis that's being marketed in uh, recreational cannabis. And so one has to assume that, you know, many of the problems that we're seeing, particularly with regards to psychosis, are associated with the higher THC strains of uh, cannabis, uh, which just wouldn't figure in the treatment of uh, medical problems. Cannabidiol is an outstanding compound. 
It is present in cannabis. It is very active in a whole list of uh, diseases. And it should be administered as such. At the moment, it is not. Cannabidiol, for some strange reason, acts against a huge, huge number of diseases. Most drugs do not act on so many diseases. Most drugs act on something specific. So revered is the professor's work that farmers have named their epilepsy strain after him, based on years of his research identifying the compounds of the cannabis plant. אז מה שאנחנו רואים פה זה בעצם אימא מזן רפאל. רפאל זה אחד הזנים העתירי CBD שיש לנו. יש לה 17% CBD עם 4% פחות THC. שמה שמיוחד בזן הזה, גם רפאל וגם אבי דקל, שניהם זנים שמיועדים לילדים חולי אפילפסיה. בנוסף לזה אנחנו מכינים CBD טהור. שזה בעצם אנחנו זה תהליך מאוד מאוד מורכב, שיש בתוכו המון המון שלבים, זה תהליך שלמדנו מפרופסור רפאל משולם. בעצם בזכות הכבישים אני יכולה לשלוט על היחס בין ה-THC ל-CBD. מה שאנחנו עושים בעצם, אנחנו לוקחים את הפרח, עושים ממנו תמציות. לכן אנחנו מתאימים לכל מטופל, לכל חולה, את היחס שלו. נניח יש ילדים שסובלים גם בנוסף לאפילפסיה, הם סובלים מאיזושהי מוגבלות, מוגבלות פיזית, וה-THC ברמה יותר גבוהה, ביחס 1 ל-6, הוא גם מרגיע אותם. The main patients that we treat are uh, chronic pain that have not been responsive to other medication and have been treated for over two years in a, in a pain clinic. And the rest are cancer patients. Uh, and this treatment is not for the cancer itself. It's for the palliative care. We teach the patients how to use cannabis and then we choose the kind of the variety that we believe that's going to help them. It's very important to make them not feel guilty because they're using cannabis. Some of them come here to the consulting and said, maybe I will become stoned and very worried about drugs, but then already use opiate every day and still very worried from drugs, cannabis. And you say, I'm a nurse and I'm talking about a medical cannabis. It's all right you're using. It's exactly like all the medication that you're going to found already in your life, but it's a flower. One of Tikkun Olam's patients is Elza Afrati. She suffers from a painful condition known as spinal stenosis, a compression of the spinal cord. <laughs> Two years of conventional pain medication failed to work, so specialists referred her to Tikkun Olam, which then prescribed a preparation higher in THC. In Elsa's case, only a few inhalations are required. The pain-relieving effects were almost immediate. But it was what happened next that took us by surprise. Oh, so she can get up. You're kidding. That's what a difference it makes. So your wife is dancing now. She's dancing. So that's a big difference, right? She used to be under agitation. She used to scream. Nothing, any tablets he tried, not, never helped to her until the cannabis. That's why he continued to say, look, so every, every all this kind. So your wife used to doctor, take these? Doctor, yeah. give this. 
Another doctor bring this. Another doctor. How many medicines is this? One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, ten, eight, ten, eight, ten pieces. Ten, 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 ten pieces. medications. Yeah. Every day. Every day. Every day. Cannabis, ten minutes. Ten, ten minutes. minutes until it's work. Ten minutes, fifteen minutes. He said it's from God. He said it's present from God. The cannabis. That's what we believe, that it's present from God. I can still feel heat. I can still feel the, the cold. I can still feel the pain. Most of the body. Most of my body, but I'm paralyzed. I can't move from the neck down, only a little bit my head. Yeah. Yadidia Kanuf also travelled a similar path with opiates. They proved ineffective after a time and came with unwanted side effects. 24-7 I was thinking about death and it was strong, it was very strong and they were difficult to handle with it. So I went back to the doctors and I told them that the opiates are not, uh, not doing so well for me. What sort of difference has it made in terms of the pain relief that you experienced on the opiates? It's, uh, it's, it's very different because when I used to take the opiates, it also it numbs the pain, but it also it numbs you. I was just sitting at home, lying in bed in front of the TV, no, not motivated. But if you take cannabis, it makes you happy, it makes you your appetite, you wanna go out, you wanna go to a restaurant, you wanna go meet your friends. It's, it's a different change, a huge, a huge change before I took the pills and then took the cannabis. So so for me, it's, it's like a different world, you know. I'm up. A symptom of Yadidia's paralysis is a spinal reflex which results in uncontrolled tremors. I start feeling the effect of about a minute after I take. It takes about 15 minutes to feel the, the full uh, impact and the full uh, after 15 minutes, I'm relaxed. Yeah. Come pick up my hand, you see? You get the difference? So you're more loose? My body. If I waited five minutes more, my body will be fully relaxed. And you understand the difference? If I, if I don't take this, just a little touch of me, all my body spasm. I shake like this. And after I take it, I can touch my body, I can take a shower, relax me. You see? When I was in the accident, when I was hit by the car, and they came me the paramedics. I was pain screaming over there, and they gave me morphium. I, I was very happy for that. Now I'm happy more that I can take the cannabis that doesn't make me the side effects. So I thank God that they, they, they approved it here in Israel, and they had this common sense. It should come to the receptors that are in the brain. You have to take it into to your mouth, to think about your head, and to pass it to your head. Then it works wonderfully. Cancer patients on chemotherapy or in the terminal states need everything we can do to help them or enjoy the last days or to overcome chemo therapy side effects. You know, I see how they suffer. And if I can help some 
with the Savra. I did my job. And in Israel, you led the way. Sure. Did you have to be courageous to do that? No, empathic. Just empathic? Yeah, yeah. not courageous. It wasn't a difficult decision for you? No, it's not a difficult decision. No, I'm not the patient. I'm sitting in the right place on the table. It's not treating cancer, but if a cancer patient who cannot eat, who cannot sleep, uh, gets the cannabis, he eats better, he sleeps better, and in, it improves his whole life. So it's not treatment of cancer, but it is really, really helpful to those patients. Improving quality of life. Quality of life, and maybe a little more, because if he gets a good nourishment and he sleeps good, his whole disease maybe is progressing less. There are some stories emerging around the world, anecdotal evidence largely, that the cannabis oil is helping to cure cancer. Here we have a story. Uh, first of all, cancer is not one, one disease. Uh, breast cancer in a woman is not like a prostate cancer in a man. Two completely different diseases. Both of them have cancer, cancer cells. Uh, cannabidiol has been shown to be active in both cases, in mice. Never, there has never been a clinical trial, a large-scale clinical trial with either THC or CBD in any cancer disease, period. Uh, nothing. The professor has conducted a small-scale clinical trial, but not in the area of cancer. His study focused on alleviating the symptoms of chemotherapy in young patients. So the children were crying all the time. They were in a bad shape. The parents were in a bad shape. And we decided we have to do something. And we decided we'll be great scientists. We'll do a clinical trial with children that get the material and children that don't get the material. After a week, the physician comes to me and I can't do it, she says. I know exactly who is taking it and I know exactly who is not. Those that are taking, I, although she's not supposed to know who is taking it, I can see five children do not vomit and five children do vomit. So she started giving all the children in her department THC. She gave it 400 times and we didn't have a single case of vomiting, a single case of nausea, completely clean. And we published that, and nothing happened. And when did you publish that? 20 years ago. The moment my, the doctors are getting open to that, the moment the patients see that it doesn't harm them, and, and they hear from another patient, my treatment was so easy because we used cannabis, they're coming to us. So they're hearing anecdotal yeah, evidence from one anecdotal, another? No, no, it's not anecdotal. Total is, is happening once in a while. That's not happening once mm. in a while. All right, so it's gone beyond anecdotal. Yeah. It's clinical observation for you. It's clinical success. What's it like before and after? I shake them uncontrollably, can't get peas onto my fork, <laughs> spill my soup <laughs> down me, and afterwards it calmed me down. And I've even taken to knitting and sewing again. So it really has a noticeable improvement for you? Ah, oh, fast, yes. I was a victim of a car accident in which I suffered multiple um, broken bones, including a fractured skull. I take four prescription drugs. Painkillers? Yes. So you were introduced to cannabis tincture. What were you hoping it would achieve? 
relieve my need for the medication. And at the moment, it looks like doing that. She's doing everything that they said that she wouldn't do, from smiling, rolling over, holding her head for short periods of time, um, you know, body weight bearing. That's one thing that they said she'd never do without a standing frame, and she did it the other day. So it's, it's really amazing. Like, she's alive. She's not just a body anymore. The worst of the worst of this illness is the pain. Um, it's like, I can talk about it now because I haven't got it right, because now I'm on the oil. But it's like somebody hitting you with a sledgehammer. And now I haven't got a mountain tall enough to stand on, <laughs> to scream to the world. Um, It's given me the next 20 years. It's that simple. Has there been merit in the anecdotal evidence presented so far? That's a good question. Ultimately, we need to know what anecdotal evidence is actually helpful and what isn't. And we'll only know that by having these further trials and investigations performed. There is some evidence that cannabis can, as a supplement, reduce pain for some people. Yes, there is some evidence along those lines, although I'd like more evidence to help us and to guide us. We have over 100 randomised controlled trials on medicinal cannabis. Um, now, I find the evidence overwhelming, as Laurie does, overwhelming that this is an effective drug for many symptoms certain conditions. I, I'm at a loss to understand how some senior doctors, senior academics can say there's no evidence that it's effective and that it's highly dangerous. Frankly, I think that's nonsense. It would be wonderful if the information available was sufficient already, but one of the credoses of a doctor is do no harm. And at the moment, we don't know for certain that the cannabidiol will not harm the child's brain. Take the epilepsy example. Smoking the raw plant of cannabis actually makes epilepsy worse, and it's a well-documented you know, fact around neurologists around the world. But when we start to look at some of the anecdotal evidence, they're looking at the parts of the plant, but also the different delivery mechanisms, such as vaporising it or oil-based products, which is very different to smoking it. So we want to know what's going to be the best answers. In terms of epilepsy, though, I don't think any of the children do smoke it, they do ingest the oil themselves, so there's and a difference. And that's exactly right, but, but we know that we need to be smarter about how we approach all of this and get the right answers to get the best outcomes. This is in fact a paradigm shift really for medicine in its entirety, because what we're asking yeah, is uh, to be able to uh, advise and uh, advocate for a product, in many cases uh, the crude cannabis product, um, which has not been processed at all, um, which really removes a great deal of control out of the medical professional's hands. And that's not somewhere that medical professional people like to be, generally speaking. So as a doctor, all you ever get taught about cannabis um, you get taught very little, but the little you do get taught about is cannabis as an illicit drug and the harms associated with cannabis use. So there isn't any contemporary medical education around any of the potential therapeutic effects of cannabis. So do you believe that more doctors need to be educated about well, medicinal cannabis? Well, at the moment we need to know what the answers are to it before we start to educate, because at the moment it's a case of it's an illegal product obtained illegally and people don't have the experience with it. With great respect to my colleagues in the AMA, um, the AMA um, is not a, an expert body of uh, forensic uh, people or neuropsychologists or addiction specialists. They're our trade union and they're there to stand up for us. Um, but it doesn't represent um, a, um, an expert opinion if you like. Um, it's an opinion and it's an important one. And what's frustrating for me as a doctor is that here is preventable misery and suffering uh, endured by people with serious illnesses, endured by their loved ones, their families, and 
we can't use all the weapons that are potentially at our disposal to relieve misery and suffering. What, what's wrong with us? Why can't we do this? Most physicians are open-minded, I hope. And if there are a few that, are, that know about these things and do not do it just for the profit, I mean, in the US you have sometimes somebody going from place to place and there are 200 people waiting in line. Yes, sir, I have pain. Here is it, $200. Next one, please. That's not the way to do it. I think it's about medical habits. We have uh, the habits, we are trained to use only medication that were approved, that we know every side effect, dosage, especially exact uh, composition of the drug. What's happening with the cannabis, we don't have good research. To develop a new drug needs a lot of money. And the drug companies are not ready to invest, not a cent. And that may well represent an extraordinary conflict of interest. If you accept that Big Pharma has the degree of influence on society that Big Tobacco and Big Alcohol does, um, this may be the biggest uh, Rubicon that we need to cross. We've got so much faith in what we're doing and the people that are supporting us have got faith in us as well, so. I got an email a couple of days ago about an Australian woman who moved to America because her young boy's got a brain tumour and they've ended up on the oil and his tumour's halved in size. How do you feel when you hear stories like that? Like, I know I don't have a brain tumour, but Still, it's hope. Yeah, that's enough faith for us. That's, en that's enough evidence for us to just give Try. it all we've got. Yeah. Yeah. Australian momentum on the medicinal cannabis debate began in earnest with Dan Haslam. And within weeks of his story airing, his mother Lucy was compelled to coordinate the country's first ever symposium on medicinal cannabis, determined to educate families who may find themselves in a similar position. Welcome. There you are. She was backed by the state's premier. What was it that moved you about their story? You could see the eyes, you could see the pain, uh, you could see uh, the the difference, there was a, a determination and assuredness that uh, this was making a difference to them. So friends, I, I encourage you today um, to, to think big. Um, and I know that some will have differences or differences of opinion or uh, will argue that the government's not doing enough or not moving fast enough. And I say to you, we'll continue to push. Cannabis allows individuals to be independent of the medical system, which has largely failed them for decades. And really, we have to look at cannabis as an independent medicine, as well as an allopathic medicine. So what I want to share with you are the underpinnings for everything else that you hear. You know, there, there's a reason that cannabis works and the reason that it is. And it's not simply because somebody said it should be there. The patients uh, need to apply with the recommendation of a specialist to the Ministry of Health that usually issue or does not issue a license to use cannabis. The changing attitudes that are going on in the U.S., uh, which are not too dissimilar from the changing attitudes that you've seen here in Australia uh, in the last six months. It's been really wonderful and, um, you know, I'm, I'm really proud that this has happened like this. Um, this is exactly what I envisaged. Uh, it, was, it was amazing. And it's just so nice when people come up to you and there's sort of not actually words. They just hold your hand and look in your eyes and, you know, and you can see that there's words that want to come out that won't and you know that that person's got a story and they're just saying thank you with their eyes. And there was lots of that. It's not about money. It's not about, you know, which side of the law you're on. Because we've got both here. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just about working together to help each other out. So it's the best thing. And so thank you all.
There's a real sadness around today. Last night I got a text telling me that Dan Haslam had died. And even though we knew the day was coming, it didn't make it any easier. Dan Haslam was an incredible bloke. A lot of people get the chance to change the world, but not many people take it. But he took it. We come here today for a celebration of Dan's short life. We were overwhelmed, all of us, the nation was overwhelmed. He sought to alleviate the suffering and pain for those who may be enduring what he was enduring is an extraordinary act of selfless courage. So he told his story and he pushed the government and with his mother Lucy really shook this place up. They wanted other people to get the benefit of medicinal cannabis without having to break the law. We're here to hug you, um, but most importantly, we're here to continue that journey with you. Um, the journey has a long way to go uh, and we'll march, and we'll march very quickly and, and as hard as we possibly can. So with hundreds of other people today, I'm heartbroken that the cancer finally won but not before Dan Haslam's story was told. I will miss him every minute of every hour of every day. And in his honour, I will continue his legacy to reduce the unnecessary suffering of thousands of fellow Australians. Thank you. Dan's legacy is already a rich one. Inspired by Lucy's drive to stage a national symposium, Australian grandparents of a young girl with epilepsy donated a record $33.7 million to cannabis research. This is ultimately a story about love and hope. It's a great day for the University of Sydney. It's a great day for the people of Australia and the world more generally. Uh, on behalf uh, of this state and country, thank you. Um, this act is something that's going to reverberate around the world. And beyond research, it's Lucy's hope that the shift will also take place in public perception. We've all been hoodwinked, I think. Um, I feel a bit stupid that I had the attitude that I had that it was so bad and, yeah, it was, it was lack of education. And probably if, if Dan didn't get sick, I wouldn't have had the reason to go and to learn. I guess I'm on that journey that so many people go through. much of this is wrapped up in stigma? A lot of it. And it, it requires some, something outside the, the general uh, consensus of the medical profession to, to trigger people to be willing to look at it and to understand it and understand that there are sensible constraints that can be put in place through regulation that make it safe. I think the death of people my generation and older will be very helpful uh, in removing that stigma. Well, I think the way to overcome any stigma associated with medical cannabis is to have clear information about when it's beneficial, in whom it's beneficial, and what conditions it's going to help. Unfortunately, we are a conservative profession, and we do take ourselves sometimes uh, very seriously, sometimes overly seriously. Um, in a world where fewer and fewer resources are being devoted uh, to looking after patients um, and our budgets are being constantly cut back, 
It is important that we earn the respect that has been traditionally afforded to us as doctors and stand up for patients across the board, um, including involving issues that may not be overly palatable uh, to our profession. Looking back at it now, if you had said to me at the start of this year where our journey would be now, you'd I'd say, no, come on, you're joking me, you know, we wouldn't even think about doing that. But at the end of the day, you go anywhere and do anything for your child. You go and get an opiate, you know, and that's legal, but it's lethal. And you can give that to a child. But yet you can't give something that's non-psychoactive and it's not reacting in her, except for making her better. I think that's ridiculous. What's more dangerous, giving a child prednisone that could give, could kill her, give her a stroke, could have paralysis down one side, or glaucoma, kidney failure, liver failure, or medicinal cannabis, and we've had no side effects whatsoever. To me, it's a no-brainer. There's an urgency in an immediacy about it. There's an uncontestability about it, I think, that means it's something that we could and should and must deal with separately and immediately. And hopefully with medical cannabis, we can see the error of our ways and we can say, actually, uh, there are some substances which are of benefit to some people in the community if used in the right setting. Let's stop blanket prohibition. Have you seen any whales out there, Daisha? No? In the backdrop of all of this, you've had your own personal problems to contend with this year. Yeah, I got diagnosed with cancer and, you know, I didn't pick a good one to get. So um, I'm just dealing with it the way I'm dealing with it, but my priority is my family and I want to make sure things are right for them. How do you feel knowing that your son's actions are most likely bringing about an enduring legacy? Um, I'm very proud of him, but it's just, there's not a lot of joy there. This is a sad battle, really. <laughs>